is found in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 6. It was in a year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voices shook the temple to its foundations, and the entire building was filled with smoke. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of heaven's armies. Yes. Bonjour. La parole de Dieu que je vais lire ce matin vient du, du livre d'Esaïe, chapitre 6. Verset 6 à 8. L'un des sérapins vola vers moi, tenant un charbon à brûlant qu'il avait mis avec qu'il avait pris avec les pinces sur l'autel. Il approcha de ma bouche et dit Ceci a touché tes lèvres, et maintenant ta faute est enlevée. Ton péché est pardonné. J'entendais dans I'm sorry. J'entendais dans la voix du Seigneur qui disait Qui enverrai-je Qui sera notre messager Et j'ai répondu Me voici, envoie-moi, Seigneur. Thank you. Merci. Hi, good morning. Yoga Sala Futian. Good morning. Yeah. Tazama, hili mekuguza mdomo yako na uovu wako umeondolewa na dhambi yako imefunikwa. Kisha nikasikia sauti ya Bwana akisema, "Nitume nani? Naye ni nani atakaye kwenda kwa ajili yetu?" Ndipo ni, niliposema, "Mimi hapa, nitume mimi." Good morning, church. Isaiah is sinke isi amoku nki si ro na katato osi otu ni mendi seraf wefe kutem jide otu nkume di okona kaya nkoji ba wepote nelu ebi chwaja owe wero ya metu anomsi le nka e metu wo ubero nogi abwa we we zuga ajo megi buchikwa mehege we no lo nya wa yin ka ona si onye kam ge ziga onye ge jekoram we si lem zigam it was you for now jesus amen it's a mic okay. good morning buenos dias hermanos y hermanas 
Esta mañana me tocó leer el libro de Isaías, capítulo 6, versículo de 6 al 8, dice así. Y voló hacia mí uno de los serafines teniendo en su mano un carbón encendido tomado del altar con unas tenazas y tocando con él sobre mi boca dijo, he aquí que esto toca tus labios y es quitada tu culpa y limpió tu pecado. Y después oí la voz del Señor que decía, ¿a quién enviaré y a quién irá por nosotros? Entonces respondí, yo he eme aquí, envíame a mí. Amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. Thank you. In each of those languages, equally understanding to God, each one of them giving him opportunity to express just a little bit different of the nuance of his great glory and majesty that the other languages do not quite express. Put them all together, and we're worshiping the holy God this morning. This passage talks about a specific time. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died. That's very specific. There's two basic ways that our culture or that different cultures talk about time, right? One is the Cronus time, indicated by Big Ben, the first slide this morning. And so it's, it's at a very specific time, right? And I don't know why, I don't know who decided that there should be 24 indications or 24 different distinctions in one day. Why not 100, something easy to work with, you know? Or 60 minutes, whoever came up with that. Why not 10 minutes in an hour? I don't know, it would make my brain have a whole lot easier time in figuring it out. But here it is, this Cronus time, this, 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 this time that's kept track of by machines, and each of us as humans are supposed to keep up to it, right? There's a story that's told in India. India is notorious about not being very good on Cronus time, especially for their train system. Their trains just sort of seem to come whenever they want to. No matter what the station masters and the engineers do, it just sort of happens. And so it's like the noontime train today will be three hours late. Next time it's five hours late. Next time it's nine hours and 17 minutes late. But one day, there was a train scheduled at 12 o'clock noon, and right at noon, at, and, and right at noon, a train pulled into the station. And everybody cheers. Everybody's delighted. And then the station master says, sorry guys, that was yesterday's train. <laughs> well, there's not only Cronus time, they work much better on this chronological time, right? That time is a sequence of events. And so here you have a Bible timeline, each with a little symbol about the different order, the different seasons, the eras of how God is progressively revealing his will and his purposes to us throughout the scriptures. Well, that's what was happening here in this scripture, right? It doesn't say in the year 656 BC. It says in the year that King Uzziah died. And that's how they kept track of time. If you read in the Bible and Chronicles and Kings and the places where the kings are recorded, there's this, uh, after the kingdom divided and there was Israel and Judah, it will say, and the king of Judah became king in the fourth year of this king of Israel. And then it will be, and this king of Israel became king in the seventh year of this king of Judah. And then this happened in the year that Ben-Hadad invaded and all those sorts of things. Their time was scheduled according to major types of events. And so Isaiah has this vision in the year that King Uzziah died. But maybe it's a little bit more than just chronological time. Maybe there's a specific something that's happening here in this life of King Uzziah. Now King Uzziah was a king that became king when he was 16 years old. Any 16 year olds here among us today? Anybody wish you were 16 if we're going to declare you king today? Okay, so King Uzziah became king at 16, and he was king for 52 years, a long reign. For the most part, King Uzziah was a good king. 
He was a godly king. He restored uh, worship, and he did these various things that God was pleased with. But it seems that as he went along, that his kingship got to his head. In fact, it says in the scripture that as he was king, he became proud. And so one day, he went into the temple, into the Holy of Holies, or, or, or into one of the holy places, and he was going to offer incense as an offering to God. Now, to offer an offering to God, to worship God, sounds like a good thing, right? But in the tradition of Judaism, in that uh, religion, only priests were allowed to offer the incense to, to God. And Uzziah was not a priest, he was a king. He was not of the tribe of Levi, he was a tribe of Judah. And he became an ancestor of Jesus and lots of good things happened. But at this particular time, he was like, I'm going to do this offering to God. And the priests came up to him, 81 of them, and they confronted him and they said, don't do it, don't do this thing. But he insisted on doing it anyway. Because after all, he was the king. Who was going to stop him from doing it? By the way, Uzziah means my strength is in Jehovah. So a person who was dependent upon God and recognizing, but here now in this moment, very arrogantly proclaiming, I will do what I want to do because I am the king. It seems like he forgot that his strength was from Jehovah and he thought that it was of himself. It was because of his personality, because of his greatness, because of his glory. And so he began to mix this leading of the state and the leading of the worship of God together in the same group of people. And as he reached out his hand to light the incense, the Lord struck him with leprosy. And he became a leper for the rest of his days. And he was then only too glad to be ushered out but he was kept in a separate house for the rest of his days and not buried with the other king because of this, uh, uh, this uh, curse that had come upon him. The ambition of human replacing the humility that we are people that worship before God. A compromised form of Christianity or, or of Judaism in this case, that saw Judaism supporting into the nationalism of the day. Does that sound familiar to any of you? A faith, a Christian faith, that is supporting into nationalism rather than declaring this fact that Jesus is the Lord, that Jesus is the Lord over all the nations, that Jesus is above patriotism to every country, that he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. He is the one who will rule, who will reign, who will be on the throne forever and ever. Amen. So Uzziah represents a form of compromised Christianity. And when that was broken, the presence of the Lord was seen in this vision. Now today we're living under the new covenant. And so it's not about what the nation does, it's about what your heart does. What is your heart yielded to? Is your heart living in this compromised formula? Where part of you wants to worship God and part of you wants to live for your own purposes? Part of you has this kind of allegiance. Part of you has that kind of allegiance. Part of you has allegiance for the nation. Part of you has allegiance for driving a really nice car. Part of it is that you want to put in an, as hard a work as you can so that you get promotions. Other of you don't care about the promotions. You just care about the money. It doesn't really matter what it is that competes or what compromises. The question this morning is, is your heart divided or is it united in worship? That was what Isaiah was facing this morning. And so Isaiah is there before the Lord. He has this vision, and it says, The train of the robe of the Lord Almighty filled the temple. Now we have a picture of a king with a long train on his robe. Don't know that King Charles III, as he's uh, inaugurated, is going to wear any quite trains like this. But, but in those days, if, if, 
if you were a king and you conquered another king, you cut off the train of his robe and added it to yours. Okay? So the longer that robe, the train of the robe, the longer of the robe, the longer of the conquering glory that you had. So Isaiah catches this vision of God Almighty, the Lord of Heaven's armies, and he's there, and the train of his robe fills the whole temple. Why? Because he is the King of and the Lord of So, of course, it fills the whole room. The glory and the splendor of God is there. Let me ask you a question this morning. As we were worshiping this morning, the different languages and the dancing, did you catch the glory of the Lord? Next question, did you stop with the glory of the Lord or did you meet the person of the Lord this morning? Did you see the heart of the Lord that's reaching out to you that's there on the throne this morning. When all the glory dissipates, when all of it becomes silent again, that then his still small voice remains in you. He still remains the King of kings and the Lord of lords. His kingship is not dependent upon the glory. It's a mere byproduct of it. It pleases his heart. It's good that we bring it to him. But it doesn't deter at all or add anything into the fact that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The claim that Jesus is Lord is true, whether or not my heart acknowledges it. He is Lord. I don't make him Lord. You don't make him Lord. But because he is the Lord, we confess, we bow the knees of our heart to proclaim that he is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Well, it's not just the train of his robe. There's also these seraphim that are flying around. Now, nobody's ever taken a photo of a seraphim, but here's an artist's rendition of a seraphim. Six wings, glorious glory of the Lord, and there it is. There's these seraphims flying around, adding to the beauty, the wonder, the other-than-usness of this temple. Now suppose you were Isaiah, and suppose you were in that spot. There's this glorious eminence coming from the throne. There's this glory of the train of his robe. There's these seraphim flying around. It's this, it's like, what's your next thought? Hey, let me get a selfie of that. Put it on Instagram. Look where I am. What about, you know, look, I, I, I'm. But Isaiah's reaction was quite the opposite. His reaction was like, woe is me. I am going down because this is so not me. Isaiah had this understanding that that was the glory of God and that he was not glorious. Well, that was perfection. He was imperfect. Well, that was holy. He was full of gossip and slander. He says, I am doomed because my lips are not clean, because I speak filthy, because I speak gossip, because I speak slander, because I speak judgments upon other people, because I do these things that try to preserve my own sagging sense of self-identity rather than just admitting the truth, I am doomed. Because left to ourselves, we are all doomed. And in order to experience the next step of it, we have to come to this realization. Now, a lot of our culture will tell you, you're okay, I'm okay. Just, it's other people that put you down and they're the ones that are fault. But the word of God says that all of the good things that we try to do just amount to a bunch of dirty rags. That there's no one that's righteous, no, not one that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That it's not some sort of a balanced scales that says if you do all these wonderful things, that then somehow God, you know, every good thing you do, God takes away one sin. But you better do a lot more good things just in case you have sins that you weren't aware of, you know. And somehow you get into this, God doesn't grade on a curve, he doesn't work on a balanced scale, he has one way, and it's very simple, but it's difficult and costly at the same time. And it comes to this place where Isaiah came and said, I'm doomed. I don't belong here in the presence of God. 
my humanness has been shattered, I've been destroyed, I have this, these, these uh, injuries, this dysfunction happening upon me, I doubt I will make it out of here because here I am in the presence of God. Notice two things that have happened already. One, Isaiah sees God. I pray upon you a revelation of who God is day upon day, day upon day. The second thing that happens is that he realizes, I am not God. I am not holy. I am this sinful person, and he sees no way out. And that's when the grace of God steps in. Not out of the human initiative. The only thing that comes from the human is the acknowledgement that says, I am in doomed straits. And then the seraphim comes with his coal from the altar. If we could go to the next, the welder's fire. With this searing coal that says, and, and the seraphim comes and he touches Isaiah's lips. And he says, no more are you doomed because I am making you pure and holy. The touch of God Almighty from the throne comes and makes you pure and holy. It burns away all the sin, all the evil doing, all the, all the, all the compromising intentions, all the ways that you have fallen short of the glory of God, all of the lustful desires, all of those things of your heart, this one touch from God will come and will take it all away. But it only comes to those that are saying, I'm doomed. If you're saying, well, I'm going to hedge my bets a little bit here, God's not going to show up for that kind of a show. He's going to let you take option two. But when you know this is the only way, this being touched by the, by the fire of God, this fire of God that's made possible because Jesus comes into this earth, the presence of God, fully God, fully human. He dies on the cross. He rises from the, uh, from the dead. He takes your place. He dooms himself so that you can live his life. That's the trait. Your doomed life goes to him. His resurrected life and power comes to you so that now you live this life in fullness of his resurrected power. I want you to know where you stand this morning. I'm not going to tell you. The Holy Spirit tells you. The Holy Spirit shows you in your heart. Perhaps you have saying, but I've never given my heart to God I've always tried to just stack myself up. I've tried to do it on the basis of being good. Or I've tried to just push it out of my mind. I've tried to say it's just a bunch of, I, I, I'm, I'm just here because somebody forced me to come this morning. And God wants you to know that he wants to purify your heart. And it's done by opening up your heart. In just a moment, I'm going to invite, if that's you, that you can come forward and receive special prayer and can meet. And by you coming forward as you making that confession outside of a purifying touch from God, I am doomed. I'm going nowhere except into sinking, sinking, sinking sand. Now there's others of you who would be in a second category. That you can think back to a time in your life where you had that moment with God and maybe for a season you followed through but you didn't keep on following through and other things have come into place. There's been a lot of junk that's come into your life. you pursued other things, and that part of your life has surrendered to Jesus, and Jesus alone has become smaller and smaller in proportion to the rest of you. And maybe you're here this morning saying, I've just messed it up. I had my chance, and I blew it. God is a God of second chances. God is a God of saying, Whoever comes to me, I will not cast out. Whatever your prior record is, is no consequence when you come to me and open up your heart. So I'm inviting you to respond this morning to the Lord as well. So here the Lord is saying, holy, 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 or the seraphim saying, holy is the Lord of, of heaven's armies, the whole earth 
is filled with his glory. Let's go to slide number eight. You are cleansed. Have you been commissioned? When that, when that touch comes upon you and you're cleansed, that wasn't the end of the story. Then he heard the word of the Lord saying, who will go for me? Who will be my representative in this world? When we open our lives to the Lord and the spirit of the resurrected God fills in us, then that spirit of the resurrected God is what is motivating you, and you respond to that. And so Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Send me to wherever you are, spirit of Jesus. Send me to wherever you call me to go. Next slide. At work with your neighbors, with your friends and family in your homeland. Next slide. Here at church, whether you're working into other nations, people with ESL, with document assistance, immigrant resourcing, with food pantry, these ways. In our communities around here, next slide, there are unreached people groups from Iran and Iraq living close by us here. Might the Lord be calling us not to be inviting them here, but for us to be going there? That's one of our priorities, that we reach outside of our walls, outside of our normal ways, that we with intentionality go out to places. And then some of you are reaching out into your, into your homelands as well. And you're extending the gospel and the serving attitude of Christ. We go to the next one. We think of a grand design. We think of Peter Pay's outreach into his homeland of Liberia. And there's others of you doing that as well. Sorry for those of you who didn't get the mention this morning. I don't mean to be exhaustive. I'm being, I'm being um, uh, explanatory. So let's go to the next slide. This one. To you Nigerians and to all the rest of us. There's 37,000 houses, 37 million houses speaking people in Nigeria. And of them, less than 0.2% know Jesus as a personal savior. A huge swath of people and spread throughout the region. There's, you, 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 you see that meter down there, it's in the red zone. It says there's not much of momentum of the gospel penetrating into that culture. Next one. The Susa people, this is a much smaller group of people, only 200,000 in Sierra Leone, but the same sort of situation. There's these nations, these people groups out in various nations where, where if you would go into them and say, have you heard of Jesus, they would say, what's that? Are you talking to me about a new kind of soap or a new kind of foam? or something like that, that have never heard anything about this good news of who Jesus is. Why do we care? Why do we go? This is why, for the last slide. So they too can worship. Everybody deserves to have this opportunity to be undone by the majesty of the king. When the Spirit of the Lord convicts you, it's the most excruciating and exhilarating touch all at the same time. To know that there's nothing more that you can do. To know that in that fierceness of his love, he's cleansing the sin, or he's taking away the sin in order to save you, in order to cleanse you. The love always comes through. That's the distinction between the condemnation of the enemy, which is always saying it's you that there's no redemption for, versus the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that says, I have plans for you. I have a future for you. But you must meet me first, the King of glory, and become holy. Would you stand with me, please? And as we begin to worship again, I just want to open the altars and to ask that if there's any of you this morning that have never made that moment when you have had that piercing 
cleansing of the Spirit of God, when your heart has been open to Him, that you just come forward and there's uh, uh, Mr. Joe and Pastor Kia and other people here who will pray for you this morning and usher you in. If you've had that experience, but you've, but you've left it go and you've left that fire of the Lord untended in your heart, it can be renewed again this morning. So Holy Spirit, will you catch hold of our hearts as we worship you today? Will you bring us into you forgiving, amazing grace as we open our hearts, as we yield them to you, as we receive the call of the seraphim that makes us a holy people belonging to you. Amen.